So let's just dance to this beat for a second. <laughs> Appreciate this. <laughs> so I am Dr. Fenma Milhouse, as they obviously uh, stated, board certified urologist. My shirt there that you see says Black Girls Do Surgery. Um, I say that because don't ever, one of my big things is that you can do anything and, and um, if you don't see yourself in a specialty, excuse, <laughs> sorry, excuse the language, but this is like my favorite song, but anyway, um, you can do anything that you want to do. Um, and so if there's nothing else that you leave with, with any of that, anything I'm telling you is that do not limit yourself, okay? Do not pigeonhole yourself. Do not let anybody else pigeonhole you. So I'm going to continue to um, enlighten you about urology and hopefully turn one or two of you guys into future urologists by the end of this hour. <laughs> I see the chat room is already uh, getting drunk, so I love it. They're All right, so <laughs> I am... First of all, I always say this, I am an ordinary girl, okay? There is nothing, and I say this not to um, belittle myself in any way or make, uh, I say ordinary proudly, and just that there's nothing uniquely gifted or inherited, or I've, I haven't inherited some sort of unique genius or special talent or unique whatever that I possess. I'm really an ordinary girl, um, and the... Um, you uh, can take ordinary people and obviously um, put them in a position to really change lives, okay? And that's kind of what doctoring is, is taking ordinary men and women and in between and putting them in a position to really change lives. Um, I This is me um, in my sixth grade reading class. Uh, I am an immigrant. Uh, my parents and I migrated here when I was about two years old. Um, from Nigeria, and I grew up in a middle class home in Texas. So this was my sixth grade reading, uh, reading mm -hmm. class. And as any typical Nigerian household, I was basically encouraged to pursue education and become either a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer. <laughs> Those were the three options. And um, fortunately for my parents, I, I kind of immediately gravitated towards healthcare and taking care of people and have wanted to be a doctor until I was, I mean, since I was like this high. So um, I ended up, hold on, why is this not working? Come on. Okay, hold on. I lost. Oh, I just have to click here. All right. So I ended up um, at the University of Texas, I grew up in Texas, so University of Texas Austin for undergrad, and from there got into medical school at University of Texas in Houston. And this picture on the left is a picture of um, me pulling an all-nighter with my study group in medical school, and we brought somebody brought an air mattress type of thing, and I, you know, took a nap. And somebody decided to write my name, put an arrow, and take a picture. So um, I like this picture because it is it brings a lot of fond memories of medical school. Um, obviously, you guys are um, in undergrad, and so for you, the idea of medical school is probably really daunting and like this really big scary thing. But I want to let you guys know that medical school is was honestly like college 2.0. Um, it, it is a lot of information that comes at you fast. It's a lot of studying, but it's a lot of fun. You know, you're surrounded by your peers, all of you guys. Uh, one thing is, that is to remember is everybody is putting on a front, okay? Everybody, even everybody in this chat right now <laughs> is putting on a front. Everybody is putting on a front. And I say that to say everybody wants to present their best self and they're going to present them to be like very prepared, very like knowledgeable, but everybody's, you know, nervous. Everybody's doubting themselves. Everybody's scared. Everybody's, you know, uh, anxious. So um, uh, medical school, once you get past that is a lot of fun. You meet a lot of great people um, that become lifelong friends. Um, and it was in medical school that I first heard about 
urology. Um, in fact, when I was sitting where you guys were, I didn't even, had never heard of what urologist was. And um, I remember it was probably the first day or two of medical school. One of my classmates uh, told me I'm going to be a urologist. And I had to pretend like I knew what that was. And I went back home and like looked it up, um, Googled it or something, read what it was. And I'll tell you what, what it is in, uh, in a second. And I thought, mm, okay, that's definitely not anything that I would ever want to do. So scratch that off the list, you know, um, didn't think twice about writing that off at all. Um, never met a urologist, but saw some Google pictures and whatever and description and thought no way in hell that this is a field for me. And um, I was later, in a, uh, fast forward a year after that, um, sitting as a second year, and we were getting, getting ready to get a lecture from a urologist. And I was actually remember like packing up my stuff in my backpack because I figured, well, you know what? I don't really need this lecture because I plan, I don't plan on doing this. So I'm just going to go um, and exit. And as I'm like packing up, in walks um, a black woman and she introduces herself as Dr. Lenane Wesley, the interim chair of urology at University of Texas, Houston. And my jaw like was on the floor because um, up until then I had never even considered uh, as a black woman that I would become a urologist. Um, and, you know, part of is the lack of obviously representation and so much of medicine is lacking representation. And so, um, Oh, somebody said, this is how we see, we feel seeing you. Oh, that makes me so happy. So anyway, I mean, honestly, it opened my world up to just, oh my God, this person looks like me. This is another woman in urology. Okay. There's only 8% of women in urology. It's very much thought to be like a man's or boys club. And it's a woman of color. It's a black woman at that. Oh, she a badass. And I want to look, I want to like shadow her immediately. I want to be like her. I want to learn from her. And so um, I flocked to her and as, as a result, learned, found out so much about urology and I and, fig, and found out that this was a perfect fit for what I want to do. Um, I met several urologists, obviously, as um, her partners and other urologists in our department. And they were all just very welcoming to students, very happy to do like to, to share what they do. That's the one thing that you'll find generally about urologists is that we're like happy to do stuff like this because we generally love what we do. And so we could talk about what we do for a while. Um, we like interacting with students, especially students who are interested. Um, because again, when you like, when you love what you do, you really like other people who are interested in it too. So um, uh, representation matters. Um, that is without a doubt has changed my life. I would not be here without that. Um, so this picture on the right was one of my favorite pictures in life. This was um, graduation picture at University of Chicago residency. That's where I spent six years of urolo learning urology from um, some amazing uh, faculty all pictured here. Again, you know, most, you know, this is the typical urology makeup, um, <laughs> uh, white men, no, no offense to the white men in the room, just this is, you know, what we're surrounded by. But um, there is a few of us, there's, and so when they took this picture, I said, listen, I'm gonna be in the front and center of this picture. Um, I was, I'm very proud of, um, being a University of Chicago urology alum. And um, I still keep in touch with most of my attendings in this picture. Um, so this is gonna be a problem the whole time. I guess I have to keep pressing next. Okay, so currently, um, currently, sorry, I'm like trying to, currently I'm a urologist at, du at DuPage Medical Group, like they said, um, the largest private practice in the state of Illinois, and I'll tell you specifically what I do there. Um, this uh, picture on the left um, was me taken during my chief year in residency. This picture on the right was uh, during my residency, I was able to spend time in Rwanda. So we actually have a program through um, in urology called IVU Med, and it's like basically teach one, do one, do one, teach one, 
see one, do one, teach one. And so we go to multiple um, countries throughout the world and we work with their urologist there, not just doing a bunch of cases and then leaving and then no one's there to do cases further. We, we go there to teach their urologist how to do like really complex stuff um, and so that they can continue to help their, their own population. And so Rwanda is where I was fortunate enough to be a part of this group as a fifth year resident to help teach them reconstructive, um, like complex urethral reconstructive surgeries and whatnot. And so this gentleman across from me is a urology resident in Rwanda. So I thought that's just a really cool picture. Um, all right. So just so you guys know, I don't want to assume that anybody knows for sure what urology is because I, like I said, didn't when I was in your shoes. Um, urology is a surgical subspecialty. So we do surgery. That's one thing that people are sometimes not clear. Like do urologists do surgery or don't do surgery? Urologists do surgery. We're a surgical subspecialty and we focus on surgeries and the treatment of diseases that affect the urinary tract. The urinary tract includes the kidneys and the kidney tubes are called the ureter. These are the tubes that connect the kidney to the bladder. The, uh, we obviously include the bladder, a big part of the urinary tract. And then the urethra is the tube that we pee out of, okay? Um, and so this is the urinary tract. Um, and we also uh, are uh, involved or specialize in ma the male reproductive system. So everything that you see here in this picture minus the colon, is a part of the male reproductive system. Obviously the male phallus or the penis, uh, which the urethra runs through it. Um, also the prostate, which lies here. Okay, site, a common site of cancer in, in, in males. Um, the testicles, which are responsible, are the gonad for uh, males um, and responsible for testosterone production um, and the structure attached to it called the epididymis, which matures sperm and the vas deferens, which is a kind of tube or, or conduit for sperm. Um, and so um, everything um, we, people sometimes will see us as the male gynecologist or the male version of gynecologist, uh, which you, that is, um, that is fair. Uh, we don't exclusively see men, however, uh, clearly or um, non-male um, gender women have um, urinary tracts. So we treat any human, male, female, non-binary, and in between with any urinary or urologic um, um, issues. Um, the one thing somebody mentioned about nephrologists, I'll, I'll say the difference between a nephrologist and urologist, nephrologists are a medicine subspecialty. They don't do any surgeries. Nephrologists, I tell patients, nephrologists are like the engineers. They know the ins and out of how the kidney ex excretes urine and excretes um, and, and uh, 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 is important for um, our metabolic processes. They help to make your kidney function better or um, not get worse. So they're really smart, smart, smart people. They are like the brains of the operation. They are the engineers. Urologists like myself, we are like the plumbers, okay? So if there's something stuck in the pipe, once it gets out of the actual kidney itself, or if there's like um, anatomic abnormality, like a lump or a bump or a twist in the kidney that's not supposed to be there, that needs to be corrected surgically, you call us. Um, and so we're, you know, not as smart as our nephrology colleagues, but we are really good with our hands in reconstruction. So that's kind of the difference between nephrology and urology. Uh, okay, so um, in urology, there are several different subspecialties. So let me rewind this for you again. Four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, most of you guys know that. Urology residency is either five or six years. The five or six years is just depending on where you end up. There is no advantage to six years or no, like it's not considered more um, prestigious. It's just a matter of um, choice of the institution. So five or six years. Um, the six year programs tend to have an additional research year. So that sixth year 
tends to be a dedicated research year. Uh, traditionally, way even before me, it would be an extra like general surgery prelim year, but I think most of those programs have done away with that. It's really rare to find that. It's almost always a sixth year is like a dedicated research year where you are just doing research. You are not thought to, you're not rounding on patients. You're not, you're not involved in like the residency, you know, the typical residency stuff. Um, um, it's kind of nice um, in that you can also, you know, in my sixth year, I mean, sorry, in my research year, I planned my wedding, got married. I like did normal, I shouldn't say normal, but I did like, you know, regular people things. Like I went to happy hour um, at 4.30 <laughs> with my friends. Um, but even if you don't have that dedicated research year, like let's say you go to a five-year program, a lot of programs will encourage, expect, um, want their residents to be involved in some sort of clinical research throughout their residency. So even with my residency, that one year wasn't the only time we were expected to do research. We were expected to get involved with clinical research throughout the whole, you know, the whole six years in some capacity. The first one or two years, you're such a baby, so not as significant, but certainly in the later years. So um, Urology, after you graduate from urology, you can become a general urologist, which allows you to do a variety of things. General urology has so much that you can do, but there are subspecialties or fellowships that you can further specialize in if you choose. There are several like urologic oncology or cancer. Um, so they deal with like bladder, kidney, prostate, testicular, penile cancer, um, male infertility, um, sexual medicine, so they deal with in um, erectile dysfunction, um, premature ejaculation, um, low libido, you know, those type of things. Um, pediatric urology, pediatric urology deals with anything urologic that affects kids, as simple as bedwetting to as complex as, you know, genital urinary malformations or congenital um, abnormalities. Um, and reconstructive urology, which is deals with maybe trauma, um, urologic trauma, and really complex urologic reconstructions that can include um, transgender um, reconstructive surgery. So my specialty, subspecialty, um, I did an extra year of um, a specialty called um, FPMRS. And I'm just going to play this video. Hopefully it plays. Sorry, hold on. Okay. Okay, so FPMRS stands for Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery. It's a fellowship subspecialty in urology that focuses on female urology issues. We deal with things like incontinence, leakage of urine unintentionally, um, that, that obviously can affect men and women, um, but is more common in women. We deal with something called prolapse. Prolapse is a hernia. So like your pelvic organs are supposed to be obviously contained within our pelvis, but you, it things can herniate through the vagina. Um, and so that's called prolapse. We deal with that. Um, somebody said fistulas. Yes, we can deal with fistulas. We deal with interest. You guys are smart. You guys are so smart. How do you know this stuff? <laughs> yes, I see or interstitial cystitis um, or bladder pain syndromes. Um, we deal with that. It's the least favorite part of one of the least favorite parts of urology because Interstitial cystitis is just so um, unknown. We don't we don't know all the things, but so it's frustrating. But we what, but we but we deal with that. Somebody said Grey's Anatomy. Um, we deal with neurogenic bladder, neurogenic bladder, or neurologic conditions like MS or multiple sclerosis or stroke or spinal cord victims that affect the bladder. You know things that affect your ner nervous system affect your bladder abnormally. So we deal with that. So that's my subspecialty. Um, so that was four years undergrad, four years medical school, six years of residency, and one year of fellowship. And then finally, I am now working at the uh, DuPage Medical Group, largest private practice in the state of Illinois, as the pelvic um, medicine reconstructive specialist in the entire group of 
hundreds, over 400 physicians. Um, uh, we cover a large part of the Chicago suburban area. And this is um, part of my team. Um, so I'm proud to work uh, with these uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and so a urology, urologist, again, perform surgery. We're surgical subspecialty, but we don't only do surgery. There's lots of diseases and conditions that we treat medically. So we do a lot of office things. And so um, we, a urologist week is typically divided into clinic and operating room days. And actually you usually get a little bit more clinic days than operating room days. Um, and so I do clinic three days a week and about, I typically see about 30 patients eat per day on a clinic day. And so things that we may treat in the clinic or in the um, office include kidney stone prevention. So somebody's gotten lots of kidney stones, we may do a workup, 24-hour urine blood work to help medicines to help um, prevent future kidney stones. Recurrent urinary tract infections or bladder infections, superbly common, so, so common. I think I see probably 100 recurrent UTI patients a month, um, new consults a month. So we deal uh, with that a lot. Urinary incontinence, a lot of urinary incontinence may be medical man management, medications, behavioral changes, exercise, pelvic floor therapy, that kind of stuff, dietary management. Erectile dysfunction, obviously we know the um, blue pill or Viagra, so me medications for that. Um, these are just to name a few. These are not all encompassing of the things that medical things that we do in urology. I'm just kind of naming the most common. And then the fun thing about urology is even in the office, we do a bunch of office procedures. So um, we, my clinic isn't just seeing 30 patients straight talking all day. If it, it was like that, I honestly, you guys, it'd be the worst. So it's broke. It's like, you know, it's kind of broken up with some office procedures inter intermixed, which I love. We do vasectomies, prostate biopsies, something called cystoscopy, where we look inside the bladder with the camera. We do this awake in the office. We do something called bladder Botox injections. Yes, the Botox is met, it can be given in the bladder and is uh, used to treat overactive bladder. Um, just to name a few of the office procedures, we'll remove warts and other little genital things potentially in the office. Uh, we'll do bladder biopsies if they're small enough, that kind of stuff. So that's on the clinic side. And then two days a week, I am operating. And operations um, come, you know, there's a wide range of urologic operations, but kidney stone removal, very common for a urologist to do. Um, come on, keep going. Incontinent surgery, so slings or um, other procedures for, for incontinence. Um, kidney, prostate, bladder, testicular cancer removal, um, urinary tract malformations that need reconstruction, vasectomy reversals if you're a male infertility specialist, prosthesis surgery. So we have prosthesis um, procedures in urology. We have something called the penile implant, which is a way to treat refractory erectile dysfunction. This means erectile dysfunction that has not responded to anything, meds, penile injections, other things and we um, implant a device that helps get an erection. We also have something called the artificial urinary sphincter. That's a device that's implanted largely in men who have cough, laugh, sneezing, or stress incontinence, uh, which is common after prostate removal for cancer. In fact, I did one of these cases today, and we are, have an artificial device that acts as a sphincter. The sphincter is the muscle that helps keep your uh, urethra closed so you're not leaking and we implant that. So we have a wide range of things surgically to do. Um, and so I'm gonna just show you guys quickly one of the office procedures that I do. You're gonna see my rest of my screen and that's intentional. Um, it's taking you guys to my uh, Instagram page. And so this is bladder Botox injection that I did. I do this um, about mm, two days a week, um, Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, I probably Botox probably about four or five patients a week. 
Um, and it's pro it, it's a really quick 10 minute or less procedure. And you can see the Botox needle just going, you know, I'm, this is in the, I mean, patient's awake while I'm doing this. Camera's in their urethra. I'm in the bladder. You see me inside the bladder and that's the Botox needle just going inside the, um, the epithelium and the mucosa of the, of the um, bladder. And at just a little bit of Botox spread out. Um, can significantly change somebody who's got to go, got to go really bad into somebody who's um, nearly dry. Okay, so back to my presentation. And then one of the cases I listed that we might do um, uh, prosthesis wise is the penile implant. And so on my page, I talked about what the penile implant is. Dr. Um, Mulhouse. Yes. Um, we cannot see the videos that you were showing. You? Oh, you can't? No. Oh. Hmm. Oh, you know why? Okay. I think because I have to pick. Okay, hold on. New. Hold on. I just want to show you the Botox one. The other one doesn't need to be. Okay, bear with me, you guys. You can still see my presentation? Yes. Okay. New share. Here we go. Now can you see it? No. No? <laughs> we just, no? We just oh. see your PowerPoint slide. Resume share. Now do you see it? Yes, or no? there we go. Okay. That's annoying. Okay, so this is... Inside somebody's bladder, like I said, they're awake in the office and you can see the needle going inside the bladder and I'm injecting Botox, a little bit of Botox, like half a milliliter at a time and spreading this with it throughout the bladder. And this is about a 10 minute procedure in the office that I do, um, like I said, about four, pa four or five patients a week. And um, it really can make a significant difference in bladder control, urgency, incontinence. So one of, one of my favorite office procedures to do, okay? So then let me, it's kind of annoying that it doesn't automatically kind of share this, but we'll get through it, don't worry. Okay, uh, pause, pause share. Here we go, all right because I have a couple more videos, we'll skip that one, um, just for the sake of time. Okay, so um, um, in the operating you, room- I think you have to screen- Oh, thank you, thank you. Please keep me honest. Okay, okay, there you go. Got it? All right. So um, we do a wide range of procedures, um, different types of surgeries. We'll do traditional open surgeries which are becoming less and less common, but this is a traditional open surgery that you guys are seeing. Obviously you can't see the actual surgery, sorry. But even if you were shadowing me in real life, you probably couldn't see much anyway <laughs> in an open surgery. Um, but this is a patient who's getting their bladder removed for bladder cancer. And when we do that, we have to reconstruct or substitute the bladder for something. Um, and so we, tip, we use part of the colon typically. Um, so that's what you're seeing in this procedure. Um, mm -hmm. The other type of surgery is genital surgery. So obviously I'm a urologist, we do work on the penis. And also because I'm a female pelvic medicine specialist, I do work in the vagina. I do a lot of work in the vagina. So this is a vaginal prolapse procedure um, that um, I'm completing and I'm basically reconstructing the vagina back into place where it belongs because it was hanging out. Um, and then we'll do endoscopic surgery. Endoscopic surgery means using small cameras or scopes and, to, and placing them in native orifices to access that body part and treat them. Um, so, you know, for instance, GI specialists do um, colonoscopies. They put a camera in to look and evaluate your colon. Urologists, we do a lot of endoscopy. We do cystoscopies to look inside the, bla inside the bladder. We may scrape out bladder tumors, treat bladder stones, and do a wide range of other things. We do something very commonly to treat stones called ureteroscopy. The ureters, remember, are the kidney tubes that connect the kidney to the bladder. So we can take a small camera inside the bladder, and then we can see the hole where the kidney tube meets the bladder and go up into that 
um, ureter and go all the way up into where the stone is either in the ureter or in the kidney. And then we typically have to use a laser to break it up and we uh, remove it with a basket. So this is a, I'm gonna have to pause and share and all that stuff again. So hold on. Hopefully this is it. Do you see just the, the like video or do you see like my whole thing? We see the whole thing. <laughs> okay. Let me the get rid of this. of screen sharing. Like you see the whole shabam. All right, yes. fine. That's okay. This is a really cool ureteroscopy video. Um, so let me back up really quick and I won't go through the whole thing. So don't worry. It's not going to be 21 minutes of watching this. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to talk. Um, so this is the scope here, okay, the ureteroscope. And so this ureteroscope is inside the patient's ureter. What he's feeding, this tiny, the tiny blue filament that you saw is the laser. Um, so right, what, what I want you to do first is look here. This is an x-ray. So we use x-ray and we use vision. The x-ray is showing us, this is the kidney up here. And then you can't see the whole ureter because it's very thin, but the ureter is going this way. So bladder would be down here, kidneys up here. Can you guys see my laser, my pointer, hopefully? No. Or no? No. Oh. Dang it. <laughs> yes. Oh, wait, we see, your, we see your pointer, yes. You see my arrow? Yes. Okay, good. So this is the, um, this is his camera. Okay. And you see this faint area right here. Can you guys see where I'm circling? Yes, no, maybe so. Hopefully. Um, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> that is the stone. So that is the stone that we see in this camera on camera in the ureteroscopy, okay? So we'll first try to pinpoint it via x-ray and then we'll use vision obviously to see it. Once we see it, we'll feed in the laser. This is the blue laser fiber. The laser fiber on contact breaks it up. You see how it's chiseling it, almost like it's chiseling you know, for gold or something. And we'll break this up into fine pieces that we can remove smaller pieces safely out of the ureter. This can be a very tedious surgery or it can be a very fun surgery. Just depends on how hard stones can be. Some stones are really hard to break up. Some stones are really easy to break up just depending on their, their um, makeup. Um, and so once we've broken it up, I'm gonna fast forward to 18 minutes. Then we take a basket. This is the basket. So it has a, it's really thin. He's trying to show that on his hands. He's feeding in the basket. Um, his um, assistant is manipulate. He's going to manipulate the basket. When he says open, it's he's going to open it. So you can see his assistant is opening the basket, and the basket is looping around the stone and closing the basket. And then we take the stone out that way. We have to do this with every single fragment that we've just broken up. Okay. I tell patients in the op before the operating room, I was like, imagine the claw, um, like the carnival claw thing where you have that, the big claw that's trying to get the toy that you want. Okay. Imagine having to do that several times. So, um, um, it can be, you know, kind of tedious and annoying at some point. Um, but it is a fun surgery when it work go goes very well and it's basketing very nicely. So you can see he's removing this, this one stone fragment out completely and he'll go back and have to do that again, okay? All right, so let me go back to my video. I mean, to my PowerPoint, I apologize, yeah. And you can see the PowerPoint again now. Yes. Perfect, okay. So, and I'll skip over this, um, but basically this was me really excited because it was a huge stone and um, it took, you know, a couple hours to do, but I was able to get all the fragments out. So success there. Um, very common surgery that, that we perform here. So another um, per, uh, way that we do surgery is uh, minimally invasively. Um, and one minimally invasive way is called laparoscopy, which is where we, instead of doing a traditional open cut, we'll use small cuts on the body 
uh, about the width of your finger. And through those small cuts, we'll take these long instruments, a long camera and access the, the body that way. And so there's monitors, these monitors are 2D. So we get um, length and width, but we don't get depth. Um, and we um, generally will have somebody who's manipulating the camera and maybe one other instrument. Um, and then um, the surgeon who will be manipulating a couple, two, maybe two other instruments. This is me and a gynecologist, a colleague um, doing um, a prolapse procedure laparoscopically. Um, now to my favorite type of surgery, uh, robotic surgery. This is what one of the things that makes urology so cool, you guys. Uh, robotic surgery um, is where we take laparoscopy um, and upgrade it. Everything's upgraded. And so instead of struggling with your arms like this at the patients, you know, manipulating, seeing 2D, you get to sit at a nice console. So this is a surgeon sitting in a console. The um, viewer that their head is in shows us three dimensions. So we see depth and it magnifies everything. So everything looks bigger and closer and easier. Um, also, um, the surgeon um, controls the arms of the instruments that have been positioned. And so like joysticks uh, that you're playing on a video game, we have little joystick things that we can manipulate these arms and it eliminates the tremor that you know we naturally have as humans. We naturally can have tremor, especially when we're doing really fine things. This eliminates all of that. And so you're comfortably sitting down ergonomic and you're doing surgery and a magnified 3D vision. You do always have an assistant who's at the bedside to manipulate, you know, to swap out instruments in case we need to use like scissors or we need to use something else inside um, and just make sure um, to pass uh, needles through. And so robotic surgery um, pioneered largely because of urologists. Urologists were doing robotic surgery before most other specialists were doing it. Now everybody's doing it. Um, and um, we do it for a lot of urology stuff. We take out prostates robotically. We take out kidneys robotically. We take out, we take out, um, we reconstruct, reconstruct the ureters robotically. We take out bladders robotically. We fix prolapse robotically. So this is me fixing prolapse, doing a prolapse procedure robotically representing UT. Uh, um, hook them and um, sitting at the console. So definitely um, one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's so much fun. So I want to show you guys a couple of these clips. Um, do, 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 do. Hey, boo. All right, if it'll play, hurry. So like I said, I didn't mean it, mean it to be muted, but that's okay. Um, this is the robotic arms that you see um, and they're trying to just, um, show you like how fine that they, the stuff that they can do. They can really work with really fine sutures. Let me get rid of this. If you press no thanks, it should go away. You know what, the, the y'all's, oh, there we go. <laughs> There's so much going on on my screen, you guys. It's like, I see myself, I see everybody else. <laughs> All right, so the patient, so they're just showing how robotic surgery is being utilized in different specialties. Cardio, cardi, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, ENT, um, urology, general surgery, um, all sorts of things. So, and again, that's just showing you, this is the joysticks type of thing that we would use while we're sitting um, in the console, looking and manipulating into the body. And uh, patients go home uh, much quicker than traditional open surgery. Okay, so let me show you a second video. Let me know if you can not see this video that's loading, okay? So 
one of the common things that we do is take out part of the kidney for cancer. Um, a partial nephrectomy is the name of that procedure. And so if it's a small enough tumor, we can just take out part of it and not the whole thing. Taking out part of the kidney means that we have to temporarily obstruct or, clip or um, uh, clamp the uh, main renal, renal artery and uh, oftentimes the vein too that feeds the kidney. Because if we just start cutting into a kidney that's not clamped, it's going to bleed profusely. Um, so this is showing an animation of that. Clamps are placed temporarily on the renal artery, and then the tumor and a rim of normal kidney are excised deep enough. You want to always get a little margin of normal kidney around the tumor. Um, the tumor is then removed and taken off as a specimen in the bag. And then we um, close the defect um, using um, sequentially placed sutures. We also will put um, like this gel uh, for hemostasis or uh, blood, uh, you know, to control the bleeding um, inside the defect. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here. So that's just showing um, closing the defect after the tumor has been removed. and then the gel that we place on. And then once that's all done, I kind of fast forward, the clamps are removed, okay? The renal artery clamps are removed to allow blood flow to circulate back into the kidney. You can safely clamp off the blood flow to the kidney um, for, you know, even a little bit, even over half an hour if you need to, okay? Um, so the last, video clip I'm going to show you is that was obviously an animation doesn't look that nice and pretty and well demar demarcated in real life um, so I'm going to show you a real life case so this is the renal artery there let me back up I think I wanted to show you the tumor first okay here you go so there's the tumor okay normal kidney here tumor there. And so now they're trying to find the renal artery, um, what we call the hilum. And you can see the renal artery pulsating right there. Very um, obvious. This is the most tenuous part of the case. Obviously, it's a big pumping artery. We don't want to injure the artery. We injure it. Um, it could mean losing the whole kidney. Okay. Um, the other thing is there's really important other big big ass blood vessels nearby that are important for other parts of your body. Um, and so we don't want to inadvertently injure or clamp something else that's not that, okay? So this is the, you know, a little bit of the stressful part of the procedure, but once you got that clamp, then you try to work efficiently, um, but you, you don't need, you know, but um, effectively to take the tumor out. You want to, we want to, we like to aim for under 30 minutes of clamping time. Um, just, you know, because, um, you know, there, there used to be a huge uh, thought that it would really do significant damage, but actually uh, more recent studies have shown that it's not as bad as, as we once thought, but we still like to aim for less than 30 minutes. So the surgeon is um, taking the robotic scissors and cutting out the tumor in a rim of normal kidney tissue that you can see nicely there. That um, will get put in a bag um, and taken out of the body. We have these things, uh, these bags that you can put through these small incisions and they kind of open up. For now, he's gonna just put it away because he, he's thinking time. Time is kidney, so he just wants to get this kidney um, closed so he can take these clamps out, all right? So fast forward. That's that gel that I told you that helps to decrease bleeding. Um, so, and we use clips, these um, clips at the on the sides that you can see these white and blue clips. And some more gel. And now once that's closed, now you can take that clamp off, take that out. And then you can, and then see, you can see he said 17 minutes. That's how long it took him to do all of that, okay? And um, then you can take, this is the bag that opens up, 
you put the tumor in there, close it and take it out of the body. Okay, so let me go back to my PowerPoint. Great. So I'm going to end with encouragement for all of you guys. Um, everything seems very daunting as a pre-med um, and certain, this is certainly on um, uncertain times. Um, but one thing that is a constant is people will always need physicians. People always need somebody to care for them. Medicine is extremely rewarding and it is a privilege to take care of um, patients and have them trust you with their body. It's definitely a journey. Um, and during this journey, it will, there's going to be highs and lows and there's going to be failures and doubts um, and, um, and everybody goes through it. Okay. You're not alone. Uh, imposter syndrome is pervasive and I still have imposter syndrome where I feel like I don't belong here. What, you know, somebody's made a mistake. Um, so um, just know you're not alone. Um, it's normal. Good things come to those who believe, better things come to those who are patient and the best things come to those who do not give up. Don't let anyone tell you what you can't or cannot be or define or limit you. You see here in this picture four black women, we're all immigrants from humble beginnings and we're all badass female surgeons. This is a um, onco uh, cancer um, oncolo oncologist surgeon. This is a plastic surgeon. That's me, the urologist, your favorite urologist. And this is a vascular surgeon. Um, I love this picture just because, you know, we all went to, we all went to University of Chicago um, and this was us as old women getting together. <laughs> And if there's not a seat at the table for you, guess what? Get some wood and make your own table, okay? This was me presenting alongside two really big names in urology. I mean, um, huge names in urology. And they picked little old me to be the third person on the panel. I don't know who made a mistake, but I owned it. Um, and find friends and mentors who will encourage you, like-minded individuals um, who are in your goals. And please don't forget to enjoy the enjoy life and enjoy the ride along the way. This is um, a bunch of my residency uh, colleagues um, at my wedding having a good time. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Milhouse. That was so <laughs> informative. Everyone in the yeah. chat loved how you explained things. It was. <laughs> It was amazing. And the representation is awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so would you, do you want to go through the questions or do you want me to read some? Please go through the questions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So there was some questions when you were talking about robotic surgery. Yeah. They asked, so what is the time in surgery? If there is a difference between doing a robotic case versus an open surgery and also what, what was the learning curve like for doing robotic surgery? So um, it depends. The, the time depends because if you are, a lot of open surgery is fading out. So if you ask a, um, somebody like me, hey, doing an open prostatectomy where we remove a prostate, how long is that going to take me? That's probably going to take me six, seven hours to do because I, you know, maybe saw 10 open prostates my whole six years. I'm not familiar with it. If I had to do a robotic prostatectomy, that may take me three, four hours to do because I saw about a million of those. So part, a large part of the time depends on obviously the surgeon's um, uh, comfortability or, you know, familiarity, I should say, um, and experience with um, that route or that procedure. There is a little bit of like robotic setup that goes into any robotic procedure. So, you know, with open surgery, you get the patient asleep, prep the belly or whatever, take a knife and, oh, you know, get to going. With robotic surgery, you've got to position the patient wherever, you know, and wherever way you're going to, um, you know, intend on placing the ports. You have to make the incisions, the small incisions, and they need to be placed strategically so that you have the robot arms aren't clashing into each other and you're, you know, targeting you know, the, the right part of the body. You don't want to place arms in the pelvis and you're trying to be in the chest, for instance. Um, and then you have to dock the robot. So the robot itself has to be kind of carefully um, placed in. So there's about a 30 minute at least set up for all of that. Um, as far as the learning curve, um, 
there is obviously a learning curve for the robot. You have to learn how the robot um, docks. How, how do you put the instruments in the body safely? How do you change out the instrument safely in the robot? How do you utilize the joystick? I will tell you though, putting your head into the console and seeing a 3D image and util util using the joysticks is, is extremely um, uh, intuitive. It's extremely intuitive. It's not, you know, um, you know, it's ha normal hand-eye coordination that you would think of. Um, there's not a huge learning curve in actually just figuring out to manipulate the joysticks in seeing in the console. And once you sit there in that console and see this super clear view, which you do not see in open surgery, because open surgery, it's in your face, but you don't have a magnified view. The, the robot gives you that magnified view. Once you see that you're, you know, it's like, wow, this is, every surgery should be done this way. Um, but yeah, so there is a learning curve. Um, mo most current urology residents have had plenty of robotic experience um, in residency um, because we are post robotic age or, you know, it's not like a new thing. We are doing it. It's a like standard of care thing now. So again, my, the, you know, the um, exception was big open surgeries now. Um, now the norm is robotic surgery. So by the time you finish residency, you're going to know those. You're going to have that curve down. Um, there was a question of saying, why do patients recover more quickly from robotic surgery? Just because the incisions are smaller. Okay, so if we have to do a nephrectomy, that partial nephrectomy that I showed you guys, uh, typically we'd have to make a big like shark bite cut across, you know, under your rib. Okay. So that's a big cut. It's a, it's a hard location too, because it hurts really, you know, that part, that's, that part hurts. Um, it hurts to breathe. So when we do robotic pro partial nephrectomies, now we don't have to go all the way in the ribs. We just go kind of towards the whatever it's, let's say it's a left side kidney. We just go on the left side of the abdomen, small cuts. I mean, if one cut is about the width of my finger, you see what I'm saying? So that's why. There were a lot Less of questions. blood loss too. Okay. Thank you. There were a lot of questions about minority representation and black populations. Yeah. And they were asking, what do you envision for the future of urology? And have you seen an increase in the representation of Black populations, minorities in the field of urology since you've been in? Well, first of all, we have to do better in these subspecialties in medicine. We have to do better in that we have to, I mean, if you don't know it it even exists, how are you going to know you want to be it? You can't be what you can't see. Like I said, I didn't even know what a urologist was until I got to medical school. You know, and so are we, and so we need to be out there talking to people before they even decide they want to be a medic medicine. Hey, high school students. Hey, guess what? I'm a urologist. Look at what I do. You know, um, and so I, that's a large part of why I started my own Instagram and why I love doing things like this because, you know, you, you have no idea. You have no idea like the, the, the scope of what we do. So we in urology, have to like make that people aren't going to seek something they don't know about um and we are we're slowly doing that it's a slow process admittedly but we're slowly doing that um i think the fortunate thing is in the age of social media it's easier to connect with people earlier on it's easier to have a presence it's easier to get that word out um to connect um so that's i think it has to only get more diverse. It has to only get more, you know, representation. Um, we uh, we know we have we've come to terms with the fact that, you know, medicine um, there's inherent bias, and that um, minority patients tend to do better in the hands of minority physicians. Uh, you know, um, uh, ethnicity congruent physicians. There's been studies that show black patients, for instance have better outcomes with black doctors. They, we see that in neo, as young as babies. Um, uh, black newborns have better outcomes with black physicians, okay? Um, and so, and uh, we have to, um, it's not to say that obviously non, you know, minority physicians can't take care of 
minority patients. That's not at all what we're saying. What, but what we're saying is there's a reason for that. We need to get to the root of that. We need to increase representation and diversity. We also need to do way better in um, um, teaching cultural competency um, and uh, understanding our own bias in medicine. Thank you. Um, someone said that they're really happy that there are people like you advocating for my <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so another question, well, there's actually several comments saying how you've inspired people to look into urology or heavily Yay! consider it now. Um, <laughs> and so people are asking, how did you decide urology and were there any other specialties that you had considered pursuing during medical school? Well, you guys, I mean, honestly, I, you know, seeing the, uh, 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 I will tell you, call it closed-minded, call it whatever. I mean, this was 2008, two, wait, no, 2006. I honestly, if you would ask me before I got that lecture from Dr. Wesney, do black people go into urology? Do women go into urology? I probably said no. <laughs> I probably would have said no, you know they don't do that. You know what I'm saying? And because I didn't see women who were urologists, I didn't even, no one even, even my own dean at my medical school, when I told her I wanted to do urology, she like kind of poo-pooed the idea. Like we've never really matched a woman in urology and women don't go for that. Maybe you gotta, you know, so, um, you know, and, and then, you know, uh, a black woman, you know, so that just changed my whole, I mean, seeing her was the main initial motivating force. But what did it obviously was learning about it. Number one, people, urologists are happy. They love what they do. They are happy surgeons. They aren't, I mean, this is obviously generalized um, uh, in fairness, but it's, 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 uh, it was very much a theme. Um, we get to deal where we don't take ourselves too, too seriously because we deal with a lot of quality of life issues, a lot of personal personal issues. We're talking to men about their erections and their penises. We're talking to women about their vaginas. We're doing all this other stuff that you're peeing on yourself. So we definitely are, tend to be people who are easier to talk to. Um, and um, we do a lot of cool, innovative things too. Um, so all of those things went into the main, you know, final decision. I thought of uh, nephrology for a little bit. Um, but then I realized like it was, it's, it's all, it's, um, I just am not smart enough for nephrology. So nephrologists are, I think, are this one of the smartest specialties in medicine, um, uh, of all of medicine. Uh, the I also thought of dermatology. Um, I think I like the appeal of, oh, this is nice. Lifestyle's nice. Money's nice. But then I hated looking at skin. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> I mean, I spent one day in dermatology clinic shadowing, and I was like, oh, this is so boring. Um, so check that off. Um, I thought neonatology because babies are cute, but then I had to deal with parents. I definitely didn't want to do that. So all of peds and neonatology and anything ped related, that checked off. Um, and then I really seriously thought about gynecology, OB-GYN, because I did gravitate towards women issues. Obviously, as you can tell, I became a female pelvic medicine specialist. I gravitated towards women's issues, um, but I wasn't in love with the OB part of it. So, and then again, when I just got found urology and then found that you could do female pelvic, female urology, ah, please, done and done, you know, so. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead, this will be the last question for tonight. Um, what advice would you leave us undergraduate students, those applying to med school, especially now during COVID? By the way, I don't mind staying around for 10 extra minutes for questions. Okay, we can um, we yeah. can answer this question and then if people- I don't know if the Zoom will kick us off though. No, no, no. Uh, okay. we, you can answer this question and if people need to go, they're more than welcome to. But if you guys want to stay around and verbally ask questions after this one, you can go ahead and do that. We'll cut it off at 810. Okay, okay. so sorry, okay. repeat the question. Um, what advice would you leave undergraduate students applying to med school, especially now during COVID? Um, I would say that don't let COVID stop you from your goals, okay? You know, do not let it deter you from your goals. And in fact, find ways and opportunities like this that you can use that kind of, you know, uniquely put you um, in, a dip in a position to still connect with mentors, still connect with, um, with other uh, uh, medical 
uh, specialties. You guys are really early in the um, journey too. So the a lot of the things that like, let, for instance, like residents who aren't able to um, do as much hands-on or um, medical students who aren't able to do as much hands-on, they're at more of a slight disadvantage than you guys are at because you're going to get that, okay? You'll get plenty of, of that hands-on and in due time. Um, right now, you um, want to do well in school, number one. Okay, I mean, that's just the case. You have to do well in school. So make sure you're balancing well um, your workload, but then also cultivating. And now in COVID, you may have extra free time. Cultivate a passion, a hobby, pick up something that is way different than medicine. Medical schools love well rounded people, they love people who have something cool that they can talk about. Oh, I played the guitar. Oh, I learned how to yodel. Oh, I, you know, have a um, YouTube that talks about blah, blah, blah. Um, I dance. Um, I, you know, play ping pong. I don't know. You know, um, whatever it is, um, I do magic tricks. Um, we had a person who interviewed who did magic tricks. So, you know, cultivate, if there's a, a passion that you have, man, it feed into that, okay? Um, pour into that too, okay? You don't want to lose all of yourself and just become this kind of boring medicine person. Um, and then use social media to your advantage. Um, don't be afraid to connect with people. Don't be afraid to DM people. Man, DM me. Um, don't be afraid to, um, if you see somebody like, wow, I think I have a opportunity that I'd like to present to them or I'd like to pick their brain or whatever the case may be. Or maybe they, you know, you um, are trying to look for some um, remote research opportunity. The worst they can do is say no, no, thank you. But keep, don't be afraid to reach out. Okay, so if you guys have some questions, um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask it. Um, we'll just take turns and do it for about five more minutes. This this question. Oh, come here. Say hi to everybody. Oh, hi. <laughs> you look so happy to join us. <laughs> I'll be there in five minutes. Okay. All right. Bye. Um. All right. So, okay, so if you guys have questions, you can go ahead and somebody, answer yourself. I'll answer one of them that I've just seen. Oh, okay. How okay. challenging was it to be a woman in a male dominated uh, specialty? Um, so my residency was amazing. They love, they love women actually. Um, they, um, so I got, I was received well and completely, you know, respected. Um, I didn't feel any sort of um, misogyny from my attendings. Um, I will say this, however, in general, women in surgery have to kind of be a little thick skinned. Um, you can't, um, women, we women um, tend to doubt ourselves more than our male colleagues do. We tend to like triple check, oh, okay, wait, am I on the right track? We tend to, you know, maybe, um, just be a little bit more cautious. And that's not a bad thing, actually. It probably um, is a part of why um, studies have found that actually women physicians, um, patients have um, better outcomes with women physicians, but it can be a double-edged sword in that we can come off um, not sure of ourselves, we can come off uh, just not confident. And so I wanna tell everybody um, uh, to have the confidence um, uh, of, I, I, I don't like to say this because I know there's men in here and I'm not disparaging men, but in general, men have higher confidence than women, have the confidence of a mediocre man, okay? Whether you do or don't. And also fake it till you make it, okay? So um, I would recommend, particularly if you're going into a surgical field as a woman, to keep those like mantras in mind um, because it will go a long way. What you what you uh, present yourself out outwardly is what people are, th that's how they're going to respond to you. Um, and so I always had that outwardly confidence, even though inside I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing and I don't know why I'm here. 
<laughs> and it wasn't a dangerous confidence, like I'm going to do something that I have no business doing, but it was a, I trust, I am confident that this is where I I, I am supposed to be here. You, um, I am, you know, the resident that you want and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, now from a patient perspective, patients are fools. Okay. So patients are definitely going to give you all sorts of, um, sexist, um, uh, remarks. Um, you know, there's been plenty of racist remarks from patients from a patient standpoint. Um, there can be some of that. I mean, I wouldn't say most patients are not like that, I would say, but there's, there's, uh, you know, enough for, that I could probably write a, uh, a short uh, novel <laughs> of experiences. So, um, and as you're, when you get into a position like where you're, where you're the attending, you don't have to, you don't have to, you can have a zero tolerance for that. You know, it's hard to have a zero tolerance as a resident. Um, you can, notify somebody but if they don't do anything about it you kind of are helpless but as an attending I have zero tolerance for that um so um it was it wasn't all in all it was it had its challenges but it was better than I thought and anticipated it to be I will say this sorry one last thing the one thing that is still challenging is the surgeon's lounge or the physician's lounge in general is still has that old boys mentality. It still has that locker room mentality. It still has some misogynistic comments and things that we are slowly breaking down. Um, and so that tends to be the most toxic part place in the hospital is the physicians or the surgeons lounge. Great, thank you. Someone said you should write a novel and I completely, ag I completely <laughs> I really, agree. <laughs> I really should. <laughs> or someone said a podcast as well. That would oh be awesome my god! As well. I, we, I think we all do, listen. Does somebody want to do the pot? Like take, like manage the podcast for me? Then I'll do it. Cause I listen. You know, somebody said, "How do I balance life and stuff?" And the answer is, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm juggling too much as it is. You have some. You have some takers in the chat for your podcast. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then, do you want to tell everyone your Instagram handle so they yes. can go ahead and follow you? Yeah, so at, I'll write it into at Dr. Milhouse with one L um, on Instagram. That's where I'm most prolific. Um, I am on Twitter, but I rarely tweet. Um, I am on TikTok as your favorite urologist, um, but you're going to get all of me on Instagram at, at Dr. Milhouse. Um, um, so, and that's the place if you want to contact me to do that, okay? Um, to contact me on. The other thing is I'll go ahead and put my email out there, but I'm bad at email. So if you email me, like put bold letters, you know, put your thing in bold letters as otherwise I might just read like junk, junk or something. Um, <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Milhouse. This oh, was pleasure. so informative. I know yeah. that we all learned so much and those videos were awesome. So thank okay. you. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. <laughs> all right. Have a good night. You too. Have a nice yeah. night and a great week. Take care. Bye.